In 2006, I accompanied my wife, Michelle, or Mickey, to her brokerage and investments firm's Christmas party. Mickey was one of their leading salespeople. During the event, her colleagues Bob Ford and her supervisor, Mark Henry, talked about the profitability of mortgage-backed securities, MBS. Mark encouraged Mickey to invest in MBS, but she declined, explaining that she wouldn't suggest anything to clients that she wouldn't invest in herself. Leon Goldberg, the top sales performer, was optimistic about the continued high returns from MBS. I only partially paid attention to their discussion but was curious about why Mickey wasn't investing in what seemed to be a lucrative opportunity. To avoid causing a scene, I chose to wait until we were home to discuss it with her. Mickey is highly knowledgeable about financial planning and investment strategies, much more than I am. I rely on her for all our financial decisions. After the party, I inquired about mortgage-backed securities and why we weren't investing in them if they were so profitable. Mickey explained that although MBS seemed promising, she had serious concerns about them. She saw warning signs in the market and believed that MBS could potentially lead to a collapse of the U.S. economy. While her colleagues focused on immediate gains, Mickey warned of a possible housing market crash when the bubble burst. Given that I worked as a project manager for a home builder in Jacksonville, I asked Mickey how this could impact my job. She advised me to start exploring opportunities in other industries, as she planned to do the same, anticipating trouble for Thompson and Associates when the bubble burst. Mickey's judgment prompted me to act quickly, so I sent my resume to a headhunter. Despite my efforts, I received no job offers for nine months, with my agent Bill Ferguson noting that the job market was already showing signs of economic downturn by October 2007. Ferguson then called about a job opportunity, mentioning a possible position in Asheville, North Carolina. I responded that I would need to discuss it with my wife and asked what the job entailed. Ferguson explained that the job was with Standard Auto Services Corporation, a company that builds and franchises automobile service centers. They needed project managers to oversee construction, and while the starting salary was about $2,000 less than what I was currently making, there was room for growth. I inquired about the amount of travel involved. Ferguson noted that the company was building centers in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia, so significant travel would be required. Concerned about the economic outlook, I asked how solid the company was and if they could survive a recession. Ferguson relayed that the company representative believed the service centers would be essential during a recession because people would need affordable places to service their cars if they couldn't buy new ones. I told Ferguson that I would discuss the offer with Mickey and get back to him. The next morning, when I got home, Mickey was in the kitchen making fried chicken, her signature dish and my favorite meal. After cleaning up in the kitchen, I told Mickey about the job offer from Standard Auto Services Corporation, expecting she might hesitate about moving to Asheville, North Carolina. Instead, Mickey said Asheville was supposed to be a beautiful area and asked when I would need to start. When I mentioned the start date was the first of the month, she noted that it only gave us three weeks. Mickey would need time to give notice at TNA and inform her clients that she was leaving, which she thought might take longer than three weeks. I asked if she was okay with moving to Asheville, and she reiterated that the coming economic troubles would destroy TNA and likely leave me out of work. The job offer sounded good, but she wanted to research the company first. After two hours on her computer, Mickey concluded that SASC looked solid with a good business plan and advised me to accept the offer. In October 2007, I moved to Asheville during the last week of the month and found a two-bedroom apartment, while Mickey stayed in Jacksonville to sell our house and notify her clients that she was leaving TNA. She informed her clients they could either stay with another TNA broker or transfer to a different brokerage. Mickey also sent her resume to brokers near Asheville and secured a job with a broker. Who had just opened an office there, it took a month to sell our house, and though we had to lower the asking price by $5,000, we still made a profit on the sale. When Mickey finally arrived in Asheville, I was working on two SASC service centers in western North Carolina, which allowed me to be home every night. We spent the next four months exploring the area together. In the spring of 2008, 
we bought a foreclosed house on Chandler Road, 11 miles north of Asheville, overlooking the French Broad River. It was the only house built in a planned subdivision before the builders went bankrupt. The house was a large colonial with four bedrooms, three and a half bathrooms, and a two car garage. We loved the house and thought it was perfect for raising a family, although it took time to adjust to the quiet with no nearby neighbors. Mickey quickly adapted to her new job, growing her client list and even reconnecting with some of her previous clients. In January, the two projects I was managing were completed, and I picked up two more in Tennessee, which meant spending three or four nights a week away from home. It was tough, but our plan was to stick with this job until the housing market improved, allowing me to return to the home building industry. The one upside of being away so much was the quality time when I came home. After four years with SASC, I was doing well as the company expanded, which meant more time away from home. Mickey never complained, focusing on building our wealth as an investment advisor with plans for us to start a family and retire early. In March 2012, after being away for three weeks, I returned home for a four-day weekend and was met by a serious Mickey. She told me she had been thinking about starting our family but felt our financial situation wasn't yet ideal. She had come across a new investment opportunity that could potentially get us where we needed to be within two years allowing us to start a family and for her to become a stay-at-home mom. Mickey explained that she had met an investment advisor, Dave Huffman, at a seminar and had been discussing this idea with him for a few weeks. She mentioned that Dave, who had experience in such investments, was enthusiastic about the idea and believed it could more than triple our investment. She assured me that the risk was reasonable and that they would explain the details and the required investment amount once Dave arrived later. I heard a car pull up the driveway and went outside to meet Huffman, who arrived in a red 2010 Corvette. I couldn't help feeling a bit jealous, as I had always liked Corvettes but had to drive a Ford F-150 four-wheel drive for my job. As we shook hands, I assessed Huffman, and he likely did the same with me. He was about my height, six feet two inches, with shorter, darker brown hair and a mustache. He had a friendly smile and spoke with a slight accent I couldn't quite place. When I asked where he was from, he mentioned he grew up in Pennsylvania and had spent 10 years in Cincinnati. We entered the house, and Mickey appeared from the kitchen carrying a tray with two beers, a glass of white wine, and some snacks. She remarked that since we had already met, we could get started. Mickey then began explaining the plan, noting that she hadn't shared the details with me yet. Mickey recounted how, a month ago, she was working with a client who owned a drilling company involved in fracking for natural gas in Oklahoma. He mentioned that one of his competitors was interested in starting fracking in North Carolina, where the legislature had recently approved it, with drilling expected to begin the following year. This conversation sparked an idea for Mickey. She explained that legally, to explore, extract, or sell mineral deposits, including natural gas, one must either own the mineral rights for the property or have a lease agreement with the rights owner. Mickey did some research and realized that if we could acquire the mineral rights from property owners before the drilling company did, they would have to lease those rights from us to extract the gas. This could be a highly profitable venture for us. After Mickey finished, Huffman quickly added that when Mickey shared her idea, he conducted his own research and confirmed she was correct. They could purchase the rights to the gas beneath the land without needing to buy the property, and he believed they could easily triple their investment if they acted quickly. Although I trusted Mickey's judgment, I was skeptical of Huffman and uncertain about the risks involved. Huffman explained that most landowners didn't own the mineral rights under their land, as those rights had been sold decades ago. He discovered through public records that a single family owned the majority of these rights in the area they were considering. Huffman had already contacted Daniel Owen, the head of the family, who expressed interest in selling the rights for the right price. The Owen family had retained the mineral rights when they sold the land, anticipating oil might be discovered, though it never was. It became clear that Mickey and Huffman were committed to the plan, with or without my agreement trusting Mickey. I agreed to go along with her suggestion. When I asked about the cost, they told me we would invest $500,000, matched by Dave, to purchase the mineral rights from the Owen family. 
concerned about the substantial sum, I questioned their certainty, but Mickey insisted it was an opportunity too good to pass up, with Huffman agreeing. Mickey then mentioned the need to sign a partnership agreement and grant her power of attorney to act on my behalf when I was out of town. She handed me a stack of papers, and I signed seven different documents. As soon as Huffman left, Mickey, unusually eager, pulled me to bed. Despite her initial hesitation about being in front of the window, the thrill seemed to excite her. Mickey made love to me twice more that weekend, but by Monday morning, as I headed back to Tennessee, I felt uneasy about her involvement with Huffman and the business deal. My distrust of Huffman and the large financial commitment contributed to my discomfort. Adding to my concern, during our passionate weekend, Mickey never said I love you, something she always did before. This made me question whether their act was out of love or just to fulfill her needs. Three weeks later, when I returned home, Mickey greeted me with a distant kiss on the cheek and showed little interest in my life. When I asked about the business plan, she gave a brief, unenthusiastic response. She seemed standoffish all weekend, and when I asked her about it, she claimed she was just tired and hinted that my frequent absences weren't helping. For the first time since our marriage, I was relieved to leave for Tennessee on Monday. Mickey's coldness persisted during our phone calls, though she eventually warmed up slightly. However, she continued to deny anything was wrong, which made me worry about our marriage. I tried calling at different times, and while Mickey always answered, her attitude didn't ease my concerns. She seemed annoyed by my calls, though she never said so directly. Believing that my absence was the issue, I put more effort into making her happy when I was home, but her attitude remained unchanged. As the months passed, in January 2013, as I prepared to head home for a long weekend, I called Mickey to let her know my travel plans. This time, she sounded unusually happy and warned me about icy roads due to recent snowfall. Her tone was more loving than it had been in months, making me hopeful that whatever had been bothering her was over. When I arrived home, I noticed tire tracks in the snow leading to my side of the garage, too wide to be for Mickey's Honda. The track suggested a car had been in the garage before the snowfall and made me think of Huffman's Corvette. Mickey greeted me warmly in the kitchen, but I was suspicious and asked if she had been out in the snow. She said she hadn't, but I didn't mention the tracks. By February, I was convinced Mickey was having an affair, likely with Huffman. To confirm my suspicions, I made an unannounced trip home a week early. I rented a car, parked it a quarter mile away and entered the house quietly. After checking the garage and finding nothing unusual, I hid in the basement to wait for Mickey, determined to confront her if she returned with Huffman. I could hear Huffman's Corvette long before it even reached the driveway, so I moved to the kitchen door to eavesdrop on their conversation as they came inside. I was waiting for the right moment to interrupt, but when I heard what they were talking about, I was completely taken aback. I don't understand why you're so hard on yourself this isn't your fault. He made his choice and didn't care how much it would hurt you, Huffman said. I know, but isn't there another way to handle this? Mickey asked. Well, you could file for divorce and claim adultery, but that would take at least six months. That means we couldn't be together until the divorce is finalized. If he finds out we're together, he could countersue, and you'd lose your advantage. After all that, you'd only get half of everything, and we need all of it for our plans. My way will get you everything you want. And after he pulled you away from your friends and your job, don't you think you deserve everything? Huffman explained. I didn't force Mickey to move anywhere. We both agreed that moving to Asheville was the right decision for us, I thought. It was hard for me to process what I was hearing. Mickey thinks I cheated on her, where did she get that idea? and she wants a divorce to be with Huffman. My stomach was nodding up. I wasn't worried about the divorce, that was inevitable once I learned she was cheating. But if she thought I was unfaithful, why didn't she confront me? Clearly, she didn't care enough to find out the truth. But won't I be the prime suspect? Mickey said, what are they even suspecting her of? What the hell are they planning? My mind was racing with these questions, spinning like a top. I had to force myself to focus on their conversation, which was hard given my state of shock. 
who will even notice he's missing once I become Tom Mayfield? No, nobody will be looking for him, and his body will never be found. After that, we'll sell this house and move to California. I can make myself look enough like Tom to get a California driver's license. Then we'll be in the clear, Huffman said. I thought, oh my god, they're planning to end me, and Huffman wants to take over my life. Why the hell would he want to be me? What's in it for him? So, what are we going to do it? Mickey asked. We'll do it after he files your taxes. We don't want any trouble with the IRS, and by then he should have his annual bonus. I'll handle everything. All you need to do is keep him satisfied and clueless until we're ready, Huffman replied. I was in shock. I thought Mickey loved me, but here she was on the other side of the door, conspiring to have me killed with that bastard Huffman. I was still on the basement stairs when I heard Mickey set the alarm, trapping me inside. Disarming it would reveal my presence, so I retreated to the basement, sitting in an old chair and trying to process what I had overheard. I'd never cheated on Mickey, how could she think I did? Was she really plotting with Huffman to end me? I realized I had no proof to take to the police. While stopping them was crucial, I wanted to ensure they were punished for plotting against me. Anger surged through me as I considered my options. Knowing I had to stay hidden until morning, I forced myself to sleep in the chair. In the morning, after hearing both cars leave, I went upstairs, found their breakfast remnants, and cooked myself some eggs and toast. As I ate, I began planning. I was confident I could thwart Mickey and Huffman's scheme, but I also wanted to ensure they couldn't profit if something went wrong. I realized I had until April to act. Although I briefly wondered if convincing Mickey I hadn't cheated might change her mind, I concluded it didn't matter. Plotting to end me while sleeping with Huffman was unforgivable, they both needed to pay. In the next two weeks, I cancelled my life insurance, changed my will to leave everything to the Salvation Army, and closely monitored our bank and investment accounts. By the end of March, I had done everything I could to prepare, but I still lacked the evidence needed to put them away. I knew my next step was getting inside Huffman's house. On the first Thursday in April, I returned from Memphis unannounced at 5 p.m. I parked my truck near an abandoned ESO station on Old Marshall Highway, a short distance from our house. Though it was a 15-minute drive from there, I could see the house and waited to spot Mickey. Her Honda passed by at 5.16 p.m., and I watched for Huffman's red Corvette. Instead, a brand new cobalt blue Corvette passed by five minutes later. I suspected Huffman might have bought a new car, and my suspicion grew when I saw the blue Corvette pull into my garage through binoculars. After waiting half an hour to ensure they didn't leave, I drove to Huffman's house, located in a secluded wooded area. I parked nearby and approached the house, which didn't appear to have an alarm system. Searching outside, I found a hidden key above the back door. Inside, I started my search in Huffman's study. On his desk, I found a laptop powered on and accessed it using a list of passwords hidden under the computer. Scanning through his emails, I found nothing incriminating, no correspondence with Mickey and nothing of business interest, until I discovered an email from a real estate agent in Deadwood, South Dakota, dated February 3rd. It read, Dear Mr. Mayfield, As your agent, I'm pleased to inform you that Mr. McRan has accepted your $1.5 million offer for the Deadwood Saloon Hotel and Casino on Main Street in Deadwood. I'll send the signed contract via FedEx as soon as I have it. We can schedule the closing with Mr. McRan's lawyers once they receive the due diligence check from you. Mr. McRan hopes to close the deal in early May. I look forward to meeting you at the closing. Sincerely, Matthew Johnson I was stunned. Huffman was buying a hotel and casino in Deadwood, South Dakota, using my name. Was he using the money we gave him for mineral rights to fund this? Was this part of his plan to steal my identity? I printed the letter and continued searching. Though most emails were unremarkable, I found a link to his bank account. There was no record of our $500,000 deposit, but there was a check written to Mayfield Enterprises LLC. Had Mickey and Huffman created a company in my name? I googled LLC and learned it stands for Limited Liability Company, 
which can protect personal assets from lawsuits. I wondered if they created Mayfield Enterprises LLC to buy mineral rights or for something else. Was the Deadwood purchase linked to this LLC? The more I uncovered, the more questions arose. In Huffman's bookmarks, I found a link labeled me, which led to the website for Mayfield Enterprises. The homepage featured a photo of Huffman and Mickey, identified as Thomas and Michelle Mayfield, president and treasurer of Mayfield Enterprises LLC. Huffman was already taking over my identity. The website described Mayfield Enterprises as an investment company focused on mergers and acquisitions. It seemed incomplete, and an internet search yielded no results, suggesting the site hadn't been made public yet. I found nothing else useful on Huffman's computer, so I searched the desk. In the top drawer, I discovered a loaded 9mm and left it there. In the next drawer, I found an open FedEx envelope containing the purchase contract for the Deadwood Saloon Casino and Hotel. The contract offering $1.5 million was signed by Thomas Mayfield, but it wasn't my signature. It seemed Huffman had forged it. I also found two notebooks, one blue and one green. The green notebook detailed Huffman's plan over the past couple of years, laid out like an outline for a book. The plan, which included my murder, involved Huffman, Mickey, and me. Huffman had specifically searched for a married couple around his age with good careers, no kids, and new to the area. He wanted a wife who was attractive, assertive, and trusted by her husband, who needed to work long hours or travel often. He found Mickey on LinkedIn, researched us thoroughly, and decided we were the perfect targets. He described Mickey as smart and hot, confident he could seduce her while seeing me as a drone he could easily manipulate. His plan began in 2011 when he posed as an investment analyst to meet Mickey at a broker seminar. He discovered that Mickey appreciated compliments on her intelligence and style, not just her looks. After three months, he persuaded her to have lunch with him, and they began meeting for meals regularly, at least twice a week. Huffman's next move was to send Mickey an anonymous note claiming I was having an affair in Tennessee. This sparked Mickey's suspicions, and Huffman easily fueled her anger. He convinced her to wait for proof before taking action. That proof came in the form of another anonymous note with photos showing me with a blonde woman, supposedly having dinner and leaving my hotel room. The photos were clearly doctored as. I had never met that woman. Once Mickey was angry enough to consider divorce, Huffman seduced her. Their affair began over a year ago. Huffman told Mickey he loved her and wanted to marry her after the divorce but advised her to keep quiet about my supposed cheating. He convinced her to start hiding money to prevent me from getting any in the divorce. Huffman played on Mickey's resentment, reminding her how unfair I had been by moving her to North Carolina away from her friends and family, and then allegedly cheating on her. He got her so angry that she wanted to leave me penniless. Huffman pointed out that in North Carolina's no-fault divorce court, I would still get half of everything. When Mickey finally expressed that it wasn't fair for me to get anything, Huffman suggested a way for her to get everything, planning my murder. Over a couple of months, she began to agree and started plotting with him. The idea of buying mineral rights was a scam from the start, designed to drain our savings and put the money out of my reach. Mickey assured Huffman that I was clueless about finances and trusted her completely. She convinced me that buying mineral rights was a great investment, leading me to sign the documents to start the LLC and hand over all our savings. Like a trusting fool, I did. On page 46 of the notebook, Huffman detailed a grave he dug 20 miles north with GPS coordinates. He planned to end me with cyanide in my coffee, then bury me and assume my identity as Tom Mayfield. They'd resign from my job, sell my house, and leave town. Mickey helped form Mayfield Enterprises LLC but might not have known about Huffman's Deadwood Saloon purchase. The last page of the notebook had the GPS location of Mickey's grave in Colorado, which she might not appreciate. I couldn't go to the police with the notebook since I stole it. Huffman could claim it was just a book outline. Instead, I decided to confront them, let Mickey read the notebook, record the meeting, and then contact the police. I waited until Friday, hoping Huffman would stay with Mickey so I could retrieve the green notebook. 
After returning everything to its place and staying in a nearby motel, I used the GPS coordinates to find my grave, driving 15 miles north and following a farm path for about 500 yards. Halfway down a wooded hillside ending in a swampy area, I found a grave site, a dirt pile on plywood covered with a trap and a hole about 6 feet long and 4 feet deep. Was this to be my final resting place? At 5.15 p.m. I parked by the ESO station and saw Mickey drive by. I waited until nearly 6 p.m. to see if Huffman would drive by. Then I checked his house, the blue Corvette was in the driveway. At 6.30 p.m., Huffman left, and I followed him to the SSO station. I then saw him return to my driveway and enter the garage. After Huffman's garage door closed, I went to his house checked his email, and grabbed the notebook in the Deadwood Saloon Hotel and Casino Purchase Contract. I also took the CT from his drawer for protection. I returned to my house around 8 p.m., parked outside, and entered through the garage. The Colt was hidden in my belt. In the kitchen, I heard music and voices from the living room. When I peeked in, I saw Mickey and Huffman without clothes on the sofa. Mickey had seeds leaking from her, and they were drinking wine with the music on. They didn't hear me. I was so furious I almost skipped the confrontation and shot them both. I stepped back into the kitchen and set my phone to record audio. Taking a deep breath, I exhaled slowly before walking into the room. I guess you weren't expecting me this weekend, I said loudly enough to be heard over the music. Huffman spun around so quickly that he fell off the sofa, and Mickey screamed, dropping her wine glass. The situation was almost funny, Huffman on the floor looking up at me while Mickey scrambled to cover herself with spilled wine mixing with her bodily fluids on the leather sofa. Why don't you two get dressed, and then we can have a talk? I suggested. After the initial shock, Mickey seemed unfazed as she went upstairs to our bedroom. Huffman picked up his clothes and began dressing right there. Once Huffman was dressed, I said, let's sit down and wait for Mickey to return. Let's not make a big deal out of this, Huffman suggested. Are you kidding? You're sleeping with my wife, and I'm supposed to just brush it off? This is a huge deal to me, I said. Huffman raised his hands in a gesture of understanding. We waited in silence until Mickey came downstairs in a bathrobe. She glanced at me, then at Huffman. I noticed a faint smirk on Huffman's face as he said, I could use a cup of coffee. How about you, Mickey? Why don't you make a pot? Mickey appeared calm when she walked into the room, but her expression changed to worry when Huffman asked her to make coffee. I realized from her reaction that Huffman must have signaled her to poison my drink. It seemed like Huffman was ready to take me out. From where I was sitting, I could see Mickey in the kitchen, preparing the coffee and filling the machine with water. After she was out of view, I figured she was getting ready to make what she thought would be my final cup of coffee. As she didn't return to the living room, the silence grew increasingly uncomfortable. So, how long have you two been having an affair? I asked. Huffman grinned and replied, We've been in love for just over a year now. We sat in silence for about ten minutes until the coffee maker made its usual hissing sound, signaling that the coffee was done. After another five minutes, Huffman called out, Hey, if you're free, bring in the coffee. In a minute, Mickey answered. A few minutes later, Mickey appeared with the cups, placing them on a tray before setting the tray on the coffee table. She handed me my cup first and then gave Huffman his. When she finally sat down, she looked at me with a sorrowful expression. I hope that meant she felt guilty about what she was doing. Huffman took a sip of his coffee and smiled at Mickey. I picked up my cup, held it for a moment, and then set it back down. It's too hot, I said, placing the cup back on the table. So, Mickey, why did you let yourself be drawn to this piece of trash? I asked. Huffman smirked again as he sipped his coffee and said to Mickey, you might as well tell him. It doesn't matter now, you were never around, and Dave was. Mickey said, he convinced me I'd be better off with him than with you. Her answer seemed odd to me, she didn't accuse me of infidelity, which I expected would be her go-to excuse. Huffman also seemed unsettled by her response, looking displeased. 
I picked up my cup once more and said, that's a pretty weak excuse for having an affair. Huffman glanced at Mickey and said, it's more complicated than you think. This isn't just an affair, Mickey will be my wife once the divorce is finalized. I pretended to take a sip from my cup while watching Mickey's reaction. She was focused on Huffman, who was eyeing me, clearly waiting for me to drink from the poison cup. When I set the cup back down, Huffman's frustration was evident. I decided it was time to end the pretense. Mickey, could you please fetch the notebook I left on the kitchen table? I asked. As Mickey stood up, I discreetly drew the colt from under my jacket, keeping it hidden behind my right thigh. What notebook? Huffman asked, looking puzzled. While you were busy with my wife last night, I visited your place. I found a rather interesting notebook in your desk, I said. The green one with your plans for Mickey and me. When Mickey returned with the notebook, Huffman snatched it from her and said, It's just some silly notes I made for fun. Did you let Mickey read it? I asked. I think she should. Mickey remained silent, just sitting there and staring at Huffman. Mickey doesn't need to see that, Huffman said, trying to downplay the situation. Well, the police will be very interested in it when they arrive, especially once they discover the cyanide in the coffee Mickey made for me. You two are going to be in serious trouble, I warned. Huffman stood up and moved toward me but stopped when he saw the colt in my hand. Sit back down, I ordered. I ordered Huffman to pick up his coffee cup. Looking as if he might throw it at me, I stood up, aimed it at his head, and said, sit down and be quiet. Huffman complied and sat back down, as did I. Mickey and Huffman both seemed to be waiting for me to speak. Huffman tried to maintain his composure as he sipped his coffee, but Mickey looked extremely anxious. Finally, Mickey spoke up, Tom, I'm really sorry for everything that's happened. You don't have to worry, I didn't put anything in your coffee. Huffman shot Mickey an angry look and demanded, what did you do? I found the notebook in the kitchen while making the coffee, Mickey said. And read it. Everything you told me was a lie. I was ready to end Tom because I believed your deceit, and now I discover that you plan to end me. I was so foolish, but I'm not anymore. I put the poison in your coffee, you jerk. Huffman shouted, damn you, and lunged at Mickey. She moved away, causing him to crash to the floor. As he tried to get up, his breathing became labored, and his lips started turning blue. He collapsed again, convulsing and foaming at the mouth. Within minutes, he was dead. Mickey sat on the sofa, tears streaming down her face as she looked at Huffman's lifeless body. With tears still flowing, Mickey looked at me and said, I'm sorry, Tom. You should call the police now. When they arrive, I'll confess that I put the poison in his coffee. I held the phone, ready to dial, but as I considered what to tell the police, I realized this situation might have serious consequences for me as well. Looking at Huffman's body on the floor made me feel nauseous, so I walked to the kitchen and sat at the table. Mickey followed and took a seat across from me. She buried her face in her hands and said, I can't believe I ruined my life like this. I let that bastard destroy everything. I'm so sorry. I deserve whatever happens to me now. When I didn't reply, Mickey asked, Aren't you going to call? Could you get me a beer while I figure this out? I replied. Huffman isn't going anywhere, so why should we rush? I sat quietly for 10 or 15 minutes before taking a sip of the beer and finishing it. Then I spoke again, how would you like to avoid jail time? Mickey responded, how could I? I killed him, and you saw me do it. Plus, you have that notebook with his plan to off you with my help. I also recorded our conversation. How many people know about you and Huffman? I asked. Nobody knows except for you. We made sure no one saw us together in public, and I never mentioned the affair to anyone, Mickey replied. Why did you ask if I wanted to avoid going to jail? Mickey inquired. If you want to stay out of prison, we need to deal with the problem in the other room, I said, pointing toward the next room. Deal with him? How do we do that? Mickey asked. Since he kindly left us an empty grave, we'll follow his plan but with a change. The grave will be for him instead of me. 
Mickey's face went ashen as she looked at me. You want to bury him? No, I said, we will bury him. I need you to empty his pockets. Give me his car keys, wallet, and anything else he's carrying. Can't you do that? He was your lover, and you killed him, so it's your job. Mickey went into the living room, took Huffman's wallet from his back pocket, and then rolled him onto his back to search his front pockets. After she was done, she handed me Huffman's wallet and keys. While you get dressed, I'm going to drive my truck into the garage, I said. I had to back Huffman's Corvette out of the garage before parking my truck. While in the vet, I briefly fantasized about owning it but quickly dismissed it as a problem to address later. Once the vet was outside, I parked my truck as close to the kitchen door as possible. Inside, Mickey, dressed in jeans and a sweatshirt, was waiting in the kitchen. We dragged the body to the garage, loaded it into my truck bed, and covered it with a tarp. I instructed Mickey to get in the truck while I checked for a shovel and hand truck in the back. The first ten minutes of the drive were silent until I asked Mickey why she had betrayed me. She explained that Dave had convinced her I was cheating and claimed he was in love with her. He persuaded her that leaving me was necessary for their future together. When I asked why she chose to end me instead of just divorcing me, Mickey revealed it was for the money. Dave promised that removing me would allow them to build Mayfield Enterprises and make millions. She admitted she was manipulated by her anger and guilt and knew forgiveness would be difficult, if not impossible, for both of us. I didn't respond to Mickey's explanation. Instead, I asked why Huffman was planning to take over my identity. Mickey said Huffman intended to ensure no one would come looking for me by making it seem like we had quit our jobs, sold the house, and moved to California. When I inquired about the new Corvette, Mickey revealed that Huffman had bought it a few days ago. I expressed concern that the car might be a problem and suggested selling it to avoid attracting attention. Mickey then laughed and said the car wasn't a problem at all. It was actually leased by Mayfield Enterprises for the president. Since the car was registered to Thomas Mayfield and I was Thomas Mayfield, the issue was resolved. Excited at the thought of owning the car, I quickly refocused on our situation and asked about Mayfield Enterprises. Mickey explained that the company was set up to buy troubled firms, break them up, and sell off their assets, starting with small companies and expanding as profits grew. I compared the plan to a smash-and-grab operation where a gang raids a store for valuables. Mickey didn't like the comparison but accepted the description. I then asked her what she knew about the Deadwood Saloon Hotel and Casino. She was unfamiliar with it. I handed her the purchase contract and the email from the real estate agent. After reading them under the overhead light, Mickey concluded that Mayfield Enterprises would need to proceed with the purchase unless we could find a way to cancel the contract. Mickey confirmed that Huffman had never discussed the plan with her. We drove in silence to the gravesite with only a sliver of moonlight. I used a battery-powered work light to illuminate the area. I removed the plywood covering the hole and leaned it against the truck. We slid Huffman's body onto my hand truck and rolled it to the hole. Tilting the hand truck, I let Huffman's body fall into the grave, landing face up with a smirk that I noted with a muttered remark. Disturbed by the sight, I moved on to cover the body. I shoveled dirt from the plywood into the hole, and with Mickey's help, filled the rest of the grave. We then loaded the tarp, plywood, and hand truck back into my truck and covered the grave with dead branches. The entire process took less than twenty minutes. We returned home in silence. I parked my truck outside and put the Corvette in the garage. Mickey went inside and handed me a beer. When I entered the kitchen, I told her that life would continue as usual, with me heading back to Memphis on Sunday and her returning to work on Monday. I made it clear that our relationship was over and instructed her to find a lawyer and file for divorce while I was in Memphis. I added that she needed to handle the dismantling of Mayfield Enterprises and that we would discuss things further the next day. I would be staying in the guest room. The next morning, Mickey had already made coffee. She reassured me that she hadn't added anything to it and joined me at the table. Mickey said we couldn't dismantle Mayfield Enterprises yet because of a clause in the purchase contract for the Deadwood Saloon Hotel and Casino. 
we needed to pay a $150,000 advance for due diligence before April 10, which we wouldn't get back if we backed out. If we refused to pay, we'd face a lawsuit and end up paying the $150,000 plus court costs. Mickey suggested we should at least investigate the casino and keep the Corvette, which is leased by Mayfield Enterprises. After breakfast, I planned to move the plywood and tarp from the gravesite to Huffman's garage to avoid any connection to our house. Mickey would search Huffman's house for anything linking us to him. At Huffman's house, Mickey checked the bedroom and clothes while I packed up the study. I shut down the computer, gathered papers, and found several keys. Putting everything into a box, I almost tossed the blue notebook into the box without checking it but then realized I hadn't read it. The blue notebook detailed a plan from two years prior involving a young woman named Claire. Huffman had conned her into investing in North Carolina land. Instead of leaving town as planned, he stole a car, forced Claire's car off a cliff, and fled with her money. I handed Mickey the blue notebook and suggested she read it, hoping it would make her feel better about her actions. After reading it, Mickey cried, lamenting her failure to recognize Huffman's true nature. Once she calmed down, I asked if she found anything during her search. Mickey found only a few restaurant receipts, which she discarded. She mentioned needing to return on Monday to put out Huffman's trash can and asked if there was anything else to check. I said no, as I had already searched the hall closet and kitchen. We'd review the contents of the desk box at home. Back home, Mickey and I sorted through the papers, discarding anything unimportant. We found the closing statement for Huffman's house, which was owned by another LLC called Nesco. I discovered files related to Nesco hidden on Huffman's laptop and gave them to Mickey to examine. While Mickey studied the Nesco files, I found a receipt for a safety deposit box rental at Asheville Savings and Loan in the name of Thomas Mayfield. I wondered if one of the five keys from Huffman's desk was for that box. Two keys seemed promising, one for a safety deposit box and another for a post office box. Mickey noted that Nesco had significant assets, including $540,000 remaining after Dave's $500,000 investment, Nesco's properties, in a house in the Cayman Islands. She planned to check if the key opened the Asheville P.O. box the next day but was unsure how to handle the safety deposit box. I speculated that one of the other keys might be for the Cayman Islands house or a bank account there. We spent the day discussing Mayfield Enterprises and the Deadwood Saloon Hotel and Casino. We agreed to pay the $150,000 due diligence by April and visit Deadwood and May to find a reason to back out of the purchase if needed. Until then, I would return to Memphis for work while Mickey resumed her job. Before leaving on Sunday, I asked Mickey if I could trust her now that Huffman was gone. She assured me we were in this together and would need each other to succeed. I told her I'd see her in two weeks. During my two weeks in Memphis, I completed my projects and took a week off. When I got home, Mickey updated me on her activities. She had been checking the Nesco P.O. box daily, finding only junk mail and a visa bill, which she paid using Huffman's password to access Nesco's bank accounts. I planned a trip to the Cayman Islands to check out Nesco's house. Mickey wanted to join but couldn't get time off on short notice. I arrived in Grand Cayman on Sunday at 2 p.m., took a cab to the two-bedroom bungalow with a Caribbean view, and found it furnished but dusty and musty. I emailed Mickey about the house, and she suggested hiring a cleaning service to maintain it monthly, funded by Nesco. We planned to use it as a vacation home and potentially rent it out. I enjoyed the weather and beach until Thursday before returning home. When I got home, Mickey proposed merging Nesco with Mayfield Enterprises. This would allow us to sell Dave's house and keep the Cayman house. To do this, I'd need to impersonate David Huffman to get a lawyer to give Mickey power of attorney for the merger. Mickey suggested growing a mustache and having her style my hair to resemble Huffman's photos. She had a lawyer lined up who wouldn't be suspicious. Mickey planned to create a merger agreement and a buyout agreement for Huffman's share of Nesco. We would pay Huffman's share into an offshore Cayman account and later withdraw the money. Mickey also instructed me to open the safety deposit box at Asheville Savings and Loan. It took me two weeks to grow a suitable mustache and for Mickey to style my hair. 
we successfully fooled the lawyer. While Mickey worked on the merger, I went to Asheville to access the safety deposit box. Inside, I found $20,000 in cash, a passport with Huffman's picture but in my name, and a passbook showing over $1 million in a Grand Cayman bank account. I took a few deep breaths, then collected the items, including several papers, a card with phone numbers and passwords, and put everything in my briefcase when I got home and showed Mickey what I had taken from the safety deposit box. She took $10,000 for herself and gave me $110,000. Mickey used the passwords from the card to access Huffman's Grand Cayman bank account. Since the account was numbered and unregistered, we could control the funds. Mickey changed the account password and suggested we leave the money there for future use. With Huffman out of the picture, we focused on Mayfield Enterprises and the Deadwood Saloon Hotel and Casino. We planned to visit the property to evaluate if we could exit the purchase deal, if not, we'd need to learn how to run a hotel and casino. On December 19, 2013, I reflected on the past year while having a drink. Ten months earlier, Mickey and her lover Dave Huffman had plotted to kill me. After confronting them, Huffman died. Now, I was president and CEO of Mayfield Enterprises, with Mickey as CFO. In May, we inspected the Deadwood Saloon Hotel and Casino, found no grounds to void the contract, and proceeded with the purchase. I moved to Deadwood to manage renovations while Mickey managed finances and continued her brokerage work in North Carolina. Over the past few months, Mickey and I renovated the Deadwood Hotel and Casino, now renamed Mayfield's 1870 Saloon, for its grand reopening on December 21. I admired the completed renovation as I headed to my truck. While reaching for the truck door, a voice asked if I was Tom Mayfield. Before I could react, three men assaulted me. Two restrained my arms with zip ties, while the third covered my head with a bag. They forced me against a wall, and one punched me to silence me. A car approached, and I was pushed into the back seat and forced down to the floor. I feared the worst. Was this about the Deadwood property or a betrayal by Mickey? After about half an hour, the car stopped, entered a garage, and I was dragged into a house. They led me down the hallway and into a room where they shoved me into a chair and told me to stay quiet. With the bag over my head, I could only see the floor. One abductor announced, we got him, followed by a gravelly voice asking if I had given any trouble. Another voice responded with laughter, no trouble. The gravelly voice then ordered, go get CJ. I had no idea who CJ was or what was happening. I immediately recognized it was a woman approaching by the clacking of her heels on the hardwood floor and the intoxicating scent of her perfume. As she neared, I could see her stylish shoes and delicate ankles. Despite my dire situation, these details caught my attention. Without warning, she struck me hard on the left side of my jaw, leaving me dazed. I braced for another blow, but instead, she removed the bag from my head. It took a moment to focus, but I saw a woman with big, dark brown eyes, a pretty face, and long, almost black hair. Scars on her forehead and chin did not detract from her beauty. After a brief stare, she turned and shouted, That's not him. You brought me the wrong man. Confusion settled in as one of the abductors insisted I was Tom Mayfield, the person they were supposed to grab. CJ, the woman, was angry and demanded to know who I was. I introduced myself as Tom Mayfield, which only seemed to frustrate her more. She asked if I knew Howard Mason, and I replied I had never heard of him. CJ then turned to the middle-aged man with the gravelly voice and complained about the mistakes of her team. Jimmy, another abductor, pointed out that. I had claimed to be Tom Mayfield and questioned whether the picture was of me or not. CJ asked to see the picture and held it up in front of me. The image was of David Huffman standing next to the cobalt blue 2013 Corvette, the same car parked in my garage. I could think of no lie to extricate myself from this situation, so I told the truth. I admitted knowing Huffman as a scam artist who tried to steal my identity. When CJ asked where Huffman was, I requested she cut the zip ties cutting into my wrists in exchange for the information. CJ ordered Jimmy to cut me loose. Once my hands were free, 
I told CJ that the last time I saw Huffman, he was in North Carolina and had just bought the car in the picture. Noticing CJ's anger, I asked how much he had taken from her. CJ sat down in front of me and revealed that Huffman, under the name Howard Mason, had stolen over half a million dollars from her inheritance. She explained that she had met him five years ago when he promised to use her money to buy land in North Carolina and later sell it for a profit. After a car accident kept her in the hospital, she found herself unable to locate him and had been searching ever since. I mentioned that Huffman's actions against CJ were detailed in a blue notebook I had. When I asked if the C in CJ stood for Claire, she was surprised. I offered to show her the information at my house in Deadwood, suggesting it would help her understand the situation better. CJ was wary but agreed to come, bringing Jimmy and his friends along. On the drive back to Deadwood, I sat between Jimmy and Dan while CJ drove. Upon arriving home, I warned Jimmy about a CT in my safe and asked him to wait as I handled it myself. I opened the safe, handed the CT to Jimmy, and retrieved two notebooks. I then brought them into the living room, suggesting Jimmy and Dan wait in the kitchen to keep things discreet. I offered CJ a drink, and she opted for a bourbon on the rocks, humorously noting this wasn't a date. I explained how CJ had traced me through a Corvette lease, confirming my identity with the hotel in Deadwood. I shared how Mickey and I ended up in Asheville, discovered her affair with Huffman, and their plot to end me. I showed CJ the green notebook detailing Huffman's plan to steal my identity and later end Mickey. CJ asked about the outcome, and I handed her the blue notebook, suggesting she read it alone. When I returned to the living room, CJ was in tears, realizing Huffman had deliberately tried to end her. She gave the car keys to Jimmy and asked him and Dan to return to the house while she and I discussed things privately. Jimmy handed her my cell before leaving. After being alone, CJ asked if I was a threat, and I reassured her I wasn't. She explained her scars were from a 2010 accident where she fell off a cliff, leading to severe injuries and memory loss. I shared that Mickey had used cyanide to kill Huffman, avoiding police involvement to prevent financial complications for Mayfield Enterprises. Mickey and I were now divorced but continued as business partners, with her handling finances and me managing operations. CJ, who introduced herself as Claire Johnson, a CPA from Erie, Pennsylvania, and whose father rented the house where I was held, asked to stay the night and borrow a t-shirt. I agreed. The next morning, I confirmed CJ's story with Mickey and offered to drive CJ back after she packed. CJ recognized the Corvette from the photo with Howard and was surprised it was now mine, explaining it was registered in my name since Howard had used my identity. CJ said the house was in Sturgis. I invited her for lunch in Deadwood, promising to discuss something important afterward. She met me at Patty O'Neill's Irish Pub and then joined me at my office where I showed her a spreadsheet of the Deadwood Hotel and Casino's finances. I explained the spreadsheets, one detailed the $1.5 million purchase price for the hotel, including payments, loans, and costs. CJ, a CPA, was frustrated but understood. The other spreadsheet covered Mayfield Enterprises' startup funds, showing $500,000 each from Mickey and Huffman, plus $890,000 from merging with Nesco LLC, including Huffman's house sold for $490,000. I explained that the $1.5 million likely included the $500,000 Huffman took from CJ. Shocked, CJ considered two options, a $500,000 annuity providing $2,000 monthly for 20 years or joining us as an equal partner and CFO of Mayfield Enterprises with a salary, benefits, and bonuses. CJ worried about her teaching job. I suggested she could work remotely or full-time, which I preferred. Mickey would be vice president, focusing on investments. CJ was given two weeks to decide. She stayed for the grand opening of the Deadwood Hotel and Casino and Mayfield's 1870 Saloon, enjoying the slots while her father played blackjack. By Friday, with no call from CJ, I worried she might choose the annuity and stay in Erie. On Saturday, CJ arrived unannounced, ready to start as my new partner. She moved into my spare bedroom and later found an apartment near the hotel. 
expressing my reluctance for her to leave, I admitted I enjoyed her hugs. CJ suggested a more intimate gesture, leading to a passionate kiss and taking us to the bedroom. Our kissing grew more intense as we undressed each other. Are you sure this is what you want? I asked. For the next several minutes, we talked about what we had just done. CJ then said, if we are going to have any kind of relationship, you will have to promise me that you will not date or have closeness with other women. I can commit to that if you agree to do the same, I said. After our first night together, CJ didn't move out but also didn't officially move in. She left her belongings in the spare bedroom yet spent every night with me. Two months later, my family visited Deadwood to meet CJ. They quickly warmed to each other, sharing a laugh over their history with two men, one good and one bad. After Mickey and CJ went to lunch, they returned in high spirits. Mickey updated me on her new boyfriend, Dr. Jimmy Hogan from Asheville, and suggested discussing Mayfield Enterprises with CJ the next morning. A visitor arrived at the hotel, a private detective named Leander Mossman from New Orleans. He was looking for Larry Taylor, who had stolen $700,000 from clients and promised to invest in a Deadwood casino. Mossman showed a photo of a younger Huffman, which CJ and Mickey didn't recognize. Mossman wanted to know if Taylor was involved with the casino, hotel, and saloon now owned by Mayfield Enterprises. CJ confirmed that she, Mickey, and I owned the businesses. Mossman left, acknowledging the case as a dead end. I advised CJ and Mickey to keep the visit confidential and refocus on our work. CJ questioned if Mossman suspected them of lying, but I suggested we move on. The Deadwood properties exceeded expectations, with the hotel at nearly 80% occupancy and the casino busy daily. I proposed a vacation to the Cayman Islands in October, which CJ gladly accepted. On Grand Cayman, I proposed to CJ, and she accepted enthusiastically. We married at Deadwood Town Hall, with a reception at Mayfield's 1870 Saloon. Mickey and her boyfriend were there, and they later married in Las Vegas, where CJ and I were witnesses. By June 2016, CJ and I had a one-year-old daughter and another on the way. Greg Hadley, our head of security, reported two men acting suspiciously at the casino, taking pictures and then entering the saloon. The men, John Benson and Bill Martin, presented a $4 million offer for the hotel, casino, and saloon. I noted the property's high revenue and said a higher offer would be required. They promised to return with a revised offer but refused to reveal their clients. Greg recorded the conversation, which I reviewed with CJ and Mickey the team's discussion about the legitimacy of the offer from Benson and Martin. Mickey doubted their belief in the property's revenue but suggested countering any offer they made. CJ considered accepting a higher offer if it came in, suggesting $5 million might be worth it. When Benson and Martin returned with a $5 million offer, it was countered with $6 million. They accepted without hesitation and did not request financials, raising suspicions about their true intentions. After finalizing the deal, CJ, Brittany, and I relocated to Asheville, North Carolina, bringing our furniture and Corvette with us. Our relationship with Mickey improved, leading to the expansion of Mayfield Enterprises with new franchises. Our second child, Thomas Mayfield Jr., was born in October, and Mickey revealed her pregnancy in April, shortly after giving birth to her daughter Ashley. IRS agent James Seymour contacted us regarding a possible audit of Mayfield Enterprises' origins. I invited Seymour to our home, introduced him to CJ and Mickey and he asked about the sale of the Deadwood Hotel and Casino to the Treadway Syndicate. Although we had only interacted with agents and suspected that the $6 million price might be linked to money laundering, Seymour confirmed that the Treadway Syndicate was known for overpaying for properties but found no direct link to us. Later, during a cookout with Mickey, Jimmy, and Ashley, I received a call about suspicious activity at the Deadwood Hotel. Greg Hadley, the head of security, reported pill trafficking. A raid by local, state, FBI, and IRS officials uncovered hard pills and revealed that the casino was being used for pill laundering. 
the Deadwood Police and state authorities seized the property under South Dakota's asset forfeiture law and offered it to us for $2 million. CJ was shocked, and Mickey inquired about the urgency of our decision. We had a couple of weeks, but delaying could increase the price due to federal interest. CJ suggested that the publicity could make the hotel more popular, boosting room rates and visitors. We decided to move forward but needed to find effective managers to avoid living there full-time. Both Mickey and CJ supported the purchase. By March 2020, the repurchased Deadwood Hotel and Casino was flourishing, generating over $1.5 million in annual revenue. Other business ventures were also thriving, despite the looming impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Mayfield Enterprises. We had enough funds in the Grand Cayman Bank to weather the financial strain and plan to keep our employees on for as long as possible. Looking back over the past seven years, I was amazed at how my life had transformed. Starting with a deceitful con man who sought wealth through treachery and ended up destroyed by his own actions, I had become the president and CEO of his company, inherited his Corvette, taken over Nesco, accessed his Cayman Islands account, and acquired the hotel and casino he had desired most. Most importantly, his interference led me to meet CJ. In the end, the con man's greed caused his downfall, while it paved the way for my successful and fulfilling life with a wonderful family.